Hello, everyone, and welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Stephanie Valdez, and I'm the co-owner at the bookstore. I'm absolutely thrilled this evening to be collaborating again with our friends at Verso to welcome Catherine Angel for her release of her, the release of her book, Tomorrow's Sex Will Be Good Again. Joining her this evening is Kate Zambrino. While we're coming up to one year of being closed for the pandemic, virtual programs like the one you're about to see have become bright spots in our days. And I wanna give a huge thanks to Catherine for joining us from the UK at a very late hour and to Kate for joining us on yet another Zoom. And now for housekeeping, you should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they cannot see or hear you. So if you have a question, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to submit them. We'll be asking those at the end of the program. There's also a chat button at the bottom through which I'll be posting a link to purchase tonight's book if you haven't already. And finally, we've scheduled a whole host of spring programs. So head over to our website and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. Or uh, you can also join us on Tuesday when Sophie Lewis discusses her new translation of Noemi Lefebvre's Poetics of Work in conversation with Kate Briggs. Again, that program is on our website and taking registrations now. So now a little about tonight's guests and we'll get started. Catherine Angel is a writer and lecturer in creative writing at Birkbeck University of London and the author of Unmastered, a book on desire, most difficult to tell and daddy issues. Her writing and research focus on sexuality, psychiatry, feminism, and gender in the 20th and 21st centuries. Catherine has a PhD in the history of psychiatry and sexuality from the University of Cambridge's History and Philosophy of Science Department. Kate Zambrino is the author of several acclaimed books, including Screen Tests, Heroines, and Green Girl. Her writing has appeared in the Paris Review, the Virginia Quarterly Review, and elsewhere. She teaches in the writing program at Columbia University and Sarah Lawrence College. Please help me welcome Catherine and Kate. Thanks, Stephanie. Hi. <laughs> Over to us. I get, so we were talking about this before. It's been eight years since we were in conversation at Community Bookstore. Yep. Yeah, and very surreal to be doing you know, to be seeing you in person. Obviously, we've been in touch, but in person, but not in person in yeah. this Zoom life. Zoom space. <laughs> um, and so Unmastered had just come out. It was an event for Unmastered in the mm. US. And I believe that Heroines had come out, probably had just come out as yeah, well. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, 2013. Does that sound right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I think Heroines yeah. is coming on 10 years in soon. So yeah kind of nuts um well, yeah. do you want to do you want to start off by reading or we can start off yeah. by talking or okay <coughs> just conveniently i've got a frog in my throat hang on one sec <laughs> okay so i'll read from um <clears throat> just the the beginning of the book Sometime in the early 2010s, the porn actor James Dean made a film with a fan whom he called Girl X. He would do this now and then. Fans would write to him, wanting to have sex with him, or he would put out a call to do a scene with James Dean, and the results would go up on his website. In an interview in April 2017, only a few months before the media would be overwhelmed with discussions of assault and harassment by Harvey Weinstein and others, and only two years after Dean himself was accused of, though not charged with, multiple assaults, he said, I have, a, I have a do a scene with James Dean contest where women can submit an application. And then after a very long talk and months of me saying, you know, everyone's going to find out, it's going to affect your future and basically trying to talk them out of it, then we shoot a scene. Little of the Girl X video in fact involves sex. It is mostly a long flirtatious fraught conversation which circles repeatedly back to whether or not they're going to do this, have sex, film it, and put it online. Girl X hesitates. She moves between playfulness and retreat. She's game, then agonized. She lurches ahead, then stalls. She is torn, reflective, self-questioning. She thinks her dilemmas out loud, and Dean tries to follow along. She presumably wants to do a scene with James Dean, but when he opens the door to her, she appears to lose some nerve. 
She walks into the apartment dressed in PVC leggings, a buttoned up silk cream blouse with black detail. Our gaze is behind the camera with Dean filming her. And she paces around in agitation, laughing a high pitched nervous laugh saying, oh my God, oh my God. We catch glimpses of the space. It's generically anonymous, sparkling surfaces, lots of pale wood, and then glimpses of him as he puts the camera down, distressed jeans, big white trainers. He occasionally brings a camera up to her face. She turns away. He teases her, you're a college girl, you're smart and shit, as they move back and forth in the kitchen with its gleaming central island in the corridor with its bright white dado rails and deep red walls. He asks what she wants to be called. She doesn't answer. Well, he says, I'm going to call you Girl X until you decide what your name is. She's skittish, nervous. I can't even look at you, moving away, moving in. She sits down at a shiny chrome table on a white bench. They discuss a contract. The footage fades out. We're not privy to the details. It fades back in. She takes a selfie. She's about to sign, but then she stops and says, what am I doing with my life? What the fuck am I doing with my life? She can back out at any stage, he says. They can rip the contract up. More fading in and out. We see her sign. We can figure out a stage name later, he says, unless you just want to be Girl X. I don't know, she says in a reluctant drawl. I have no idea. I've never done this. Girl X's nervousness works to flatter Dean. It's a sign of her awe at meeting this huge improbable star. But it also works to preempt any repercussions she may be fearing to undermine what might be taken by Dean, by others, as exhibitionism, as asking perhaps for trouble. She's readying herself for exposure. Girl X is doing something geared towards the hungry gaze of others, something she imagines will excite and satisfy a spectator, including perhaps the one inside herself, the one who wants to watch herself having sex with Dean. But when she asks, what am I doing with my life? What the fuck am I doing with my life? I feel her imagining, too, the gaze of another kind of spectator, a sterner one, a censorious one. Both these spectators, the one egging her on and the one admonishing her, are most likely internalised within Girl X, as they are within many women. The spectator we are primed to satisfy, and the spectator whose disapproval and reprisal we are afraid to provoke. Girl X is reckoning with the spectators inside her head, and with the power of spectacle itself. She is the impulsive seeker after pleasure. She's also alienated, self-conscious and inhibited. She veers between being unabashed and then wildly aware of the power imbalance between her and Dean. The stakes for her are high and they make the decision to pursue her own desires immensely difficult to see through. These dissociative flickers, these changes of gear and register, they come precisely from the power of punitive ideas about women's sexuality and personhood. Girl X is grappling with questions that many women may ask themselves, that I have certainly asked myself, the first time they sleep with a man or the moment they reveal their desire. Will I be in danger? In revealing myself, have I foregone privacy? Will I be ha pursued, haunted by my own actions? Will I be able to resist the unwanted desires of others? Her saying yes precluded my ability to say no. When Girl X expresses her ambivalence, I want to have sex with you, she says, but I don't know if I want to show the world. Dean is receptive. You don't want to be slut shamed. She carries on, like she says, adopting a blokey voice, I saw you fuck him. Why don't you fuck me? This is not an entirely paranoid thought. One of the accused in the 2018 so-called rugby rape trial in Northern Ireland on entering the room after two other men performed sex acts on the complainant, and when she said no, allegedly replied, you fucked the others, why can't you fuck me? A woman's presumed desire, even just once, for one man, makes her vulnerable. Her desire disqualifies her from protection and from justice. Once a woman is thought to have said yes to something, she can say no to nothing. In the film, there are many moments of laughter, joy and pleasure. It's quite charming to watch. There's humour, playfulness, teasing. Girl X and Dean seem genuinely to like each other. There's chemistry. But there's awkwardness too, and mistimed movements, her ambivalence, his uncertainty. 
Eventually they overcome the hurdles, they cross the threshold and they have sex. They're sometimes noisy, but there are silent stretches too, pauses in the action. She sighs, they laugh, they chat. In as far as it's ever possible to know from the outside, and it's not, it looks pretty good, fun, joyous. They sit in silence for a while, smiling, then agree to go for a cigarette on the balcony. You want me to turn the camera off? He asks. Yes, she says. Okay, he says. She starts getting dressed. The camera goes off, he says. The camera goes off, she says. He walks towards the camera, towards us, the viewers. The camera, he says, will go off. Thank you for that. I feel like I could listen to you read forever. <laughs> I'm just reminded, probably inappropriately, that when you and I would joke around on Twitter, I had you record the phrase cunt Kierkegaard. Do you remember that? <laughs> like, I do remember that. you do that? What was that? Um, I just thought it would be was, sexy for you to say that. It's like it was to do with um it was to do with a quote from Chris Krause from I Love Dick when she says um that what she was trying to do, and it was in an interview about I Love Dick where she said, um, I wanted to write the kind of book where I could use the words cunt and Kierkegaard in the same <laughs> sentence. And I did it and it drives people crazy, she said. And we had some exchange on Twitter about that. And uh, yeah, it's, I recorded it. It's a good a goal to write there. the kind of book where you can use cunt and Kierkegaard. And Kierkegaard, yeah. Cunt and Kierkegaard. The perfect book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have all of your, I have my Catherine Angel library right here. Oh, that's nice. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you read from the opening of Tomorrow's Sex Will Be Good Again. Um, but it also reminded me, you know, of the opening of Daddy Issues and thinking of this work that you've been writing um, post Unmastered, but also post Me Too. Um, and I thought, I was really struck when I was reading Daddy Issues today and um, I've been spending time with the new book all week, um, that this, you know, pained, searching, I'm not going to say elegant because everyone is saying elegant, but this pain, <laughs> searching, beautiful, deep, um, melancholic, it's a very melancholic book, I think, hopeful, mm. melancholic, angry, sad, um, but a lot of the searching about patriarchy, feminism, and its relationship to sex and desire seems to have been catalyzed by what I will say, and not trying to put words in your mouth, is an ambivalence around Me Too or post Me Too. And if not an ambivalence, and I think you, I think you occupy an ambivalent territory so richly, like to allow it to like, you know, to really search around for complexity. Um, but when I say ambivalence about Me Too, about how storytelling um, has, like the idea of the story and the idea of voice and the idea of narrative and the pressures to write and the pressures to speak, mm -hmm. that that's just really like with both openings. So Daddy Issues begins thinking through Harvey Weinstein and then um, Tomorrow Sex Will Be Good Again begins thinking about um about James Dean um so I, I would I would love to like ask you a little bit about how whether Me Too was this catalyzing moment for you and how um I know mm -hmm. you've been working on this book for a long time I would even wager to say you've been working on it the entire time that you and I have been in contact mm -hmm. Um, and Me Too only happened, I don't know, what's time? Two years ago, three years <laughs> yeah. ago? I have no idea. <laughs> um, but yeah. it just feels like that the real searching began to coalesce with these narratives that came out Me Too and also people's reactions to this narrative, the sort of censorious voice that's internalized that you speak about girl acts um, in the James D video is having. So I would love to hear you. I would love mm. to just hear you speak about that. It's so great speaking to, to people about your books because they can articulate so much better than you can yourself. Um, I really think that 
I mean, that it's completely true what you've said that, that there was something about that that phase of Me Too that um, kind of crystallized certain things for me. You know, things that I'd been thinking about for a very long time, the material, or some, at least some of the material in Tomorrow Sex Will Be Good Again is stuff I've been thinking about for years, if not decades. Um, but something about the the kind of like the narrative container of me too and it was such a kind of narrative phenomenon um suddenly made me see all kinds of connections between things i was thinking about but as you say it also triggered like a lot of um really mixed feelings about the way in which we talk about violence against women and harassment and power and you know on the one hand it was it was kind of exciting as a moment if horrible and depressing and kind of grueling to kind of you know wake every day to hear kind of yet another horrific story um but you know in one sense i was glad of it because i think it's important to hold people who abuse their power to account um but on the other hand i found it really disconcerting um in terms of what was being left out so you know daddy issues is partly about the way in which we seem to have completely set aside the question of these men's behavior in private. It was so much about the workplace and so only certain kinds of workplace, you know, quite privileged sort of workplaces. Um, but the, you know, the question of fathers and daughters was completely left out of the picture. And I was trying to kind of re resuscitate some of the kind of troubling relationship between ideas of fatherhood and you know, very kind of heteronormative visions of uh, of how fathers teach their daughters how to be how to be girls. Um, but in relation to this book, you know, I it's as you say, I was really disconcerted by the emphasis on women's uh, almost duty to tell their stories. You know, and there and there were even instances of people putting you know microphones in front of women's faces in interviews and saying, "So, have you been sexually assaulted?" Um, and, you know, the, the kind of investment we place in the idea of the story as the thing that is going to uh, yield illumination and that's going to catalyze change. Um, and so this kind of became entangled with my preoccupation with the, the, the idealization of speech, you know, the idea that, that, that speech is always good and, um, you know, that speaking out and speaking the truth is something that as kind of responsible women and responsible feminists we have a duty to do, whether it's about looking back and telling our stories of sexual assault or harassment, or whether it's about thinking prospectively about our safety. And, you know, a lot of the book is about um, trying to trace the way in which, you know, in the very important consent conversations that had, and, you know, lots of reiterations of the importance of consent, um, there's this trace of, of an idea that, um, that in order to be safe in sex, women have to be clear speakers of their own desire. And that is very troubling to me because it sets women up to fail and it inevitably comes back to haunt us rather than um, the men who we might be trying to hold to account. Which connects, I mean, connects to this larger idea of how much um, emotional labor is gendered. I mean, emotional labor as well as like, I'm so fucking sick of speaking all the time, of being expected to mm -hmm. speak all the time, right? Being expected mm -hmm. to be the one who speaks. Um, and I, I think you make such an interesting, um, fertile, rich, conflicting space where you're exploring like the weight and historical pressures of having to tell one's story post Me Too, that, that one is required to in writing as well as in speech, the exhaustion of that. And then, you know, feminism, like especially like a second wave feminism um, pressure that th there is a truth, that there is like one personal truth that, what, that we are expected to narrate for ourselves. Um, and yeah, this, this concept of like speech and, and consent, it's like, it's all, you know, it's all tied up with the idea of voices and who, who is responsible always for mm. like all the talking, all the work, all the thinking through, all the writing. It's, 
-hmm. And, you know, I couldn't help but, um, but think of you writing Post Unmastered, you know, a beautiful first person book, um, both raw and poetic, dealing with desire, mastery, pornography, um, you know, that was, you know, had some wonderful reviews, but, you know, was reviewed also in incredibly simplistic ways. And I couldn't help making that link between how you're writing of girl X and also like the sort of burden of the first person narrative mm. in general. And I wonder, um, mm. I wonder whether, I mean, whether you were thinking about that, um, uh, whether I'm kind of, mm. but this idea of exposure of like, this burden under with feminism with media to to tell stories of trauma to tell stories of sexual trauma or to tell stories of one's body of oneself but then how those stories are then disciplined and mm. and punished it is this very vicious cycle um mm. You know, it reminds me of, you know, Helene Sixou's concept of la parole, like speech being immediately disciplined, like mm -hmm. the idea of like to be immediately um, disciplined. And I, I'm wondering how, you know, you, you write about how in the aftermath of Unmastered, everyone always told you how brave you were, like, oh, you're so brave <laughs> to be writing this. And a little bit of internalizing that, like some sort of perceived stain that happens once one writes about the self. Could you speak to that a little bit? Mm -hmm. How you've been thinking about first person mm -hmm. narrative and how you thought about that? Because I mean this book is not is not first person. I mean it mm -hmm. is. There's there's some interjections of the eye. Um, but I would mm -hmm. love to hear your, your so it's so interesting. Yeah it's really interesting hearing hearing you talk about these things. Um like the links between them. I mean yeah it's so it's so fraught I think because you know, I, I I think that women absolutely should be able to tell their stories and um, and you know not not have their speech disciplined. Um, but I think, you know, maybe one of the threads in this book is that um, is that women's speech and their kind of storytelling becomes the place where the culture kind of offloads the responsibility for thinking ethically and politically and collectively about, you know, all the reasons, not just sexual assault happens, but why there's so much bad sex for women, why sex is like, you know, consistently more disappointing, more painful, less satisfying, and, you know, kind of laden with, with unhappiness for women. Um, that that women's speech becomes the place to kind of preempt the, preempt sexual harm and also redress it. Um, and also to, to the women's speech or this gendered speech is expected to have good sex at all. That one is supposed to talk constantly and like be able to, and one of the points that you're making is that, um, you know, sex is incredibly complex that you know, to know our desires and to be fully clear and articulate about our desires, mm. you know, emits a lot of the power relationships that's inherent in yeah. sexuality. Yeah, and is also, you know, made more or less possible um, by the culture in which sexuality inevitably emerges. So if you live in a sexual culture where uh, you know, it's both expected of you to be a kind of, um, you know, desirous kind of active sexual agent, um, plus be able to articulate that desire really clearly, but that culture also punishes that. And, you know, we, we know that the culture punishes it through various forms of media shaming, but also in terms of that, that very thing that is required of us, that confident expression of desire is what is, you know, gets read out in rape trials as evidence against women. Um, so, you know, the kind of, the, the wishfulness of that model as a, as a way to kind of redress anything, I think is really, is really interesting. You know, what, what are we doing when we, when we still kind of against all, against all the evidence place our hope in this sort of, you know, this image of uh, a confident, 
you know, ballsy woman as as the place that's going to redress these problems. It's, you know, it's very, it's very interesting to me that that we're attached to that, despite kind of knowing in in, in another part of our minds that um that's exactly what endangers us. Um but so in in sort of speaking to to what you were saying about the the relationship between these two books and the different kind of voices of the books. Um, you know, it's so strange. I mean, it's not it's not anything I was consciously doing, I think, but but over time and in this kind of long period of time between Unmastered and this book, I um it was like I was kind of reorienting myself to the idea of argument. Because I think in Unmastered, I was really what I was trying to do with that book was trying to en enact an argument, like try to sort of perform an argument through a first person voice. So I was feeling at the time I was feeling really kind of suspicious of, of like declarative sentences and, you know, argue, argumentative prose that's trying to convince people of something. I was feeling really tired of that mode and I was partly and I was feeling tired of it partly because I felt it, it often didn't allow for that for ambivalence and for sort of you know just the contradictions that live inside oneself um so I was really searching for a form that could kind of explore my my grappling with these questions about power and pleasure and desire um in a way that was much more oblique and I think gradually what happened with this book and perhaps why it took so long um was that I that I was feeling that I wanted to write a more, you know, directly argumentative book, but I was trying to find a form and a voice that would do it, that would still allow for that kind of experience of, of not being certain, you know, of trying to puzzle something out of kind of, you know, holding an object towards the light. I think that's an Elizabeth Bishop phrase and, you know, trying to capture what it, what it is for a mind to be thinking as opposed to a thought that you've kind of packaged already. Um, so I think this this was a way for me to, to try to do that in um, more declarative writing. And, and I, I still don't know, to be honest, whether, um, you know, why, why this isn't more of a first person book. I mean, I feel like I got tired. I got tired of the first person in a way, even though I think, you know, my myself is so much in this book and it's so clearly suffused with my own experiences of, uh, you know, relationships with men and sex with men and, you know, living as a, as a woman in the world. And, um, but to be honest, I don't, I don't quite know why that move happened in me at a, at a writing level. And who's to say it, it, it might be to do with just how kind of weird it was to publish a book in the first person. I think especially then, you know, in 2012, people weren't like, you know, mainstream publishing places weren't really publishing that kind of first person nonfiction by women. And I think that it's it's so much more um, kind of evident in the culture now. And it was a really strange experience. I mean, it was, you know, lots of people really understood that book. And it was also like, it provoked some really weird reactions in people. And maybe, you know, maybe I was like, <laughs> I'm done with that for now. <laughs> I don't really know. Well, I know you and I talked to, for a while that receiving criticism felt a lot like bitch get off the pole. Like that, like that felt like there was so much of a connection between the idea of um, like writing about sex or writing about the self and somehow being seen as um like voyeuristic or like mm -hmm. not voyeuristic like exhibitionist or narcissistic like there was such this um yeah there was a real I do wonder yeah I wonder post me too how whether first person narratives are perceived differently but I think you know I think you're right mm -hmm. to be critical and ambivalent about the way these narratives get commodified as well how mm -hmm. one is supposed to write as much about trauma as as possible I yeah I mean I did have we're here I did. I mean, I did have one publisher who, reading an early draft of this book, said, um, "Could there be? Could there be more of you in it?" And it's all and I, you. I mean, it's all your thinking. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Like, there's no, there's no escape from oneself. Like, all writing is autobiographical, you know. Um, but that, yeah, you know, I think 
people want women's stories, but it's so it's so kind of perverse because people want women's stories partly in order to get off on them or to um, or to then ignore them, you know. And that's what disturbed me about Me Too. It was such a kind of spectacle, and you know, obviously the movement in its origins and you know in its intentions was really important and really valuable. But in the way it became this media spectacle, there was something also about. Um, titillation and about gratification and and sort of you know the spectacle of seeing women's objection seeing you know this parade of the most humiliating moments of women's lives being told that's so interesting that that we were so spellbound by that and by the monstrous figure of Harvey Weinstein and and yet you know who does that serve like who's getting heard who's getting listened to and what changes? I I don't know, and I and I want to be wary of, um, you know, that our appetite for women's narratives can be both really well-meaning and about the gratification of seeing women in pain. Well, and also I think you know one of the things that I think you like very elegantly, but like <laughs> beautifully dissect in the book is what you call confidence feminism, is I feel like in many ways the book is structured in such a way as to absolutely politely, wittily, intelligently disembowel certain <laughs> writers <laughs> who have written about, like, I mean, to me, I think of this book as a, um, a complexity, a, a sort of, like, can we think of that as an essay form, a complexity, a complexity and ambivalence in response to like Barry Weiss or Laura Kipnis or like, um, you know, Jessica Crispins who are, you know, very, very smart people and writers, but who have this incredibly simplistic view of, you know, wounded women or a horror of vulnerability or get over yourself or grow up or it's just bad sex, that it's just bad sex mm -hmm. um, writers. I feel like in so many, many ways, this is a, a treatise that kind mm -hmm. of completely deconstructs that notion. Because, you know, we do get off on certain stories of trauma, but there's also, I think, a real horror of vulnerability um, yeah. in writing and in this culture. And I really think that's what you're taking on in this book. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was really, it was something um, that I really wanted to try and articulate in this book is that people from from many different kinds of perspectives, you know, many different kinds of feminists, many different taking up many different positions in the kind of, you know, political battle lines, um, share, I think, an attitude to, towards various things, towards Me Too, towards uh, consent, um, towards, you know, the Aziz Ansari story or, you know, whatever it is, um, that is essentially one of kind of really needing to distance oneself from the woman who is experiencing herself as a victim. And, um, and you know, the, the, the book takes a kind of complex position on these debates about consent. And I, I critique some aspects of the rhetoric around consent, not really the policies or the legal side of things, um, basically because I'm a supporter of affirmative consent um but some of the language around consent i you know i i critique in various ways but i sort of try to draw out the way in which other critics of consent um i think the the kind of motor behind their critique is a sort of impatience with that sort of wounded vulnerable women woman and 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 i in a sense i understand that impulse because i think that that the figure of the kind of wounded weak woman is is one that no one really wants to take up in the culture because she's so derided. Um, and she, you know, she evokes this kind of like lurid fascination, but actually does she uh, does she evoke concrete support? Not very much. <laughs> so it's a horrible position to inhabit. Um, but I think that it's so, it's so important to think about um, how that kind of distaste can fuel feminist politics um, and I guess what I'm trying to do in the book is to it's in in a way like 
the more I think about it, you know, talking about the book to people doing events, I've kind of realized that in a sense, this book is me trying to figure out the legacy of the 90s. So the legacy of like this kind of explosion of sort of neoliberal individual approaches to all kinds of areas of public life. Um, I just kept on thinking about that um, because you write so much about like this post-feminist moment of that Spice Girls cover of Kathy Acker interviewing Spice Girls for some reason. Right. That's what yeah. I kept on seeing as kind of uncomfortable. Yeah, the Spice Girls, moment. you know, they they are really emblematic of a, of a period. And I think that um, I was, you know, trying to disentangle the ways in which some of like the rhetoric that we use now about, you know, being confident women, finding our sexual desire, you know, finding out what we want and then telling, telling men very clearly what we want and, you know, being confident sexual agents, that has within it the traces of an essentially risk management approach to sexual mm -hmm. ethics. So it's about, it's about trying to foreclose the risk that is coming your way. And God knows we all have to do that risk management, right? And no, no shame on anyone who's doing that because we, we all have to do it. But it's like an internalization of the individual responsibility for the violence that is coming our way as the way in which we approach things that we should be collectively thinking about in political terms. But also this, you know, another trace I was kind of trying to, to evoke in, in the kind of contemporary moment is, I mean, I guess what I would call post-feminism, I think it has a slightly different ring in the US and the UK. Mm. So as dis, it's not the same thing as third wave feminism, but post-feminism being, a kind of position which um, basically sees feminism as of the past. You know, we're emancipated now because we we have sexual desire and we feel entitled to the operate in the world it. with with confidence, yeah. um, and we have social and economic equality. I mean, of course we don't, but that's the that's the narrative. Um, so so we're done with feminism, and now we can get on with being these kind of you know sassy, confident subjects. Um, and I think it's. It's so harmful because it has to deny the very fact of sexual violence as it sort of crowds in on our imaginations as well as just the the facts of our life. You know, we we encounter sexual harassment and sexual violence, but we also encounter this absolute kind of washing of narrative about risk. You're always at risk. You're, you know, if you do this, that's going to happen to you and you will be to blame. So that the, this kind of pose of confidence that we're, this ideal that we're supposed to inhabit seems to me a way of, especially in the sexual context, insisting that women in the very moment when they're the most vulnerable to sexual violence, that in that moment they must deny their knowledge of sexual violence. And that doesn't seem like a fair bargain to me. You know, I think ultimately the conversation about sexual violence should not be about how individual women navigate sex. I mean, we might talk to one another and help educate girls in how to manage that risk, but that shouldn't be the language of our politics. The language of our politics should be, why is sexual violence happening? Why, why are women's expectations of sex so low? And why do men feel so entitled to their pleasure at the expense of women's pleasure? Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about, I wanted to, I brought an object for show and tell. There's a lot of talk about consent when you have a um, young child of any gender mm -hmm. now. So a lot of talk is about like, body confidence and consent and um, like learning, especially like you don't have to kiss your grandparents. Mm -hmm. You don't have to hug your grandparents. You don't have to sit on anyone's laps. Um, and I, I brought C is for consent. Is for consent. <laughs> Have Amazing. you seen this? No. The illustrations are pretty, I don't know. I think of them as like kind of intimate and a little icky at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Should I read a minute What's, of it? Yeah, do, do. It's time for a party with family and friends. Grandma wants a hug, but Finn, Finn, isn't in the mood. That's okay, says dad. You don't have to give hugs if you don't want to. Grandpa leans down to kiss Finn. Mom says, please ask for consent first. 
Grandpa asks, may I kiss you on the cheek? Finn replies, hmm, yes, you may. Finn knows. Finn knows. What do you what do you make of what do you make of that? Like as a as a parent, how do, how do you feel about that book? Well, can you still hear me? My earplug fell out. Yeah, I can hear fine. Um, I well, I think the book is a bit is a bit um feels a bit formulaic. <laughs> it's, a bit, mm. it's a bit uh scripted, but you know. I think the idea is, and I don't know if this is like this happy, li progressive, liberal dream state, is if we teach children of any gender that consent is necessary, then they'll, I don't know, have more confidence in their bodies and know to say, I mean, I think the whole idea is to, um, is to mitigate um, like abuse to mitigate abuse, you know, at, at a young age to say, no, I don't have to, I don't mm -hmm. have to say yes to you. I don't have to do this. I don't have to do this to make you, but yeah, it's a huge, I mean, it's, it's a little, like, I sometimes feel I'm a little bit of a parody. My daughter's a big wrestler of others. She's like a real tight hugger and I'll be like, you know, the mom going consent, consent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I mean, I think so consent. <laughs> I find it, I mean, I find it really interesting because, I mean, on the one hand, I think it's, I mean, I didn't have any consent education growing up. Did you? I mean. No, and don't you remember like having to nothing. hug or kiss in-laws and you were like, oh, I don't want to do this. And that yeah, feeling loads of, of memories, I don't want to do this, yeah. but I'm going to do it to be nice. Yeah. And I think a lot of the stuff in me too was me wondering like, God, I'm like, what was wrong with me? Where I'm like, okay, to be nice or to get this over mm -hmm. with. So like, maybe, I don't know, maybe if I had had that education younger, yeah. I would have said, no, I'm not into it, whatever, go away. But you know what, but what I find interesting is that like, I mean, I think, you know, things have changed so much for the good in so many ways in terms of like, um, you know, just the availability of books that aren't all just full of really terrible kind of social models. And um, so, you know, books like that, I think, it's really great that kids are growing up with some kind of facility with these concepts. But what I find interesting is, um, is how consent has become the place that we do all that thinking. Yeah. Like that, the word, you know, Joseph Fischel in this really interesting book, he's a kind of queer legal scholar um, called Screw Consent. Um, that's about, you know, trying to, trying to make consent like fit for purpose and really do, really do the jobs we want it. We want, it to do but without like imbuing it with this kind of almost mystical power to solve all the problems to do with power and and sex um and injustice in the world he talks about um consent giving moral magic to sex oh, and when yeah. i see a book like that i kind of think about how you know it's also about the space that we want the law and legal language to take up in sure. in the culture and i think that you know legal notions of consent absolutely have to be got right and I think affirmative consent is the way forward and was a huge improvement um and you know there are all sorts of problems with the law but it's also important to get the law right but one of my qualms is like why are we using a legal notion that is about uh, agreement um but actually has nothing to do with pleasure or desire or joy or, you know, all the other kind of aspects of social life. And somehow consent is now the vocabulary with which we try and do all this other thinking. And I don't, I don't think it really helps because partly because there's a danger of conflating um, consent and the idea of agreement with, uh, with desire and pleasure, which is really dangerous to do. If you conflate those two things, you actually make it much harder to protect people who need a very kind of straightforward notion of agreement and consent to protect them, for instance, sex workers. Um, right. But it has, I think, larger kind of ripple effects, which is that we're, we're putting all our hopes in these kind of legal notions when actually, you know, the distinct, the, the, the problem for women not just women, but the problem is is not just the distinction between assault and and consensual sex. It's to do with, you know, um, 
more like subtle invasions of bodily privacy or um, you know subtle forms of pressure is to do with how we imagine sex um, and you know the fact that for women research shows that when women think about what good sex amounts to it, it amounts to not being in pain which is like a shockingly low bar you know like the, the way in which pleasure is not integrated as part of the way in which we think about how we raise young girls that combined with you know bullish entitlement to women's bodies on the part of men that's where so many of the problems lie and I don't think that consent is even the right word for that because it's not just about um you know a kind of exchange of agreements between parties having more or less equal power it's to do with unequal power relations in society and how right. that you know spreads throughout the whole of our social and sexual interactions so i find it really fascinating like on the one hand books like that i think yes thank god and and how appalling that there was nothing like that when i was growing up and then another part of me is like i want that book to be about pleasure not just consent, you know? And recognizing pleasure too. Like when I think of, you know, I think that the idea is to also, this is not a legal thing or a contractual thing, but to, to recognize when someone's enjoying themselves versus not, right? To, to be receptive, yeah. to be responsive, you know? And I think, and, and you know, if someone is, I'm just thinking of the babe.net, essay like if someone is like visibly physically cringing mm. you know yeah. to to recognize those responses and i think you know all of your reading of like the pickup artist rhetoric and the idea that you are supposed to coax someone mm. into it and that they'll eventually enjoy it once they get into it i think you know i think a lot of that could be solved by just teaching people to be empathetic right and that's like a much that's i don't think that has moral clarity yeah. but that's like yeah, recognizing like you're in you're not enjoying this you're not into this i'm going to stop even though i'm enjoying this i'm into this yeah yeah and of course you know lots of i mean countless amazing sex educators and consent educators educators all over the place are, you know are doing exactly that work through the language of consent you know consent has to be ongoing you're you're being attuned to other people's signals you know desired changes you don't you don't agree to something once and for all and then the whole night is set you know so consent consent education i think can incorporate all these insights but some of the language around this stuff i think um really try it like so you know when you were mentioning like other critics of consent and the kind of bad sex thing um it's just bad so, sex yeah it's just bad sex you know it's just the inevitable part of a sexual education and it's not assault therefore don't cry assault you know there's that there's that kind of narrative that certain critics take and i find that really disturbing because there's an insight there which is that consent cannot really help us with bad sex, right? Consent legally is about sexual assault. And some of these critics say, oh, you know, like the Aziz Ansari thing on BabeNet, that, you know, that was somebody exaggerating uh, and, you know, mistaking just a kind of crappy date with assault. And they're not wrong in a sense, right? I don't think the language of assault or of rape is appropriate in that case but it is a case of kind of sexual pushiness and bullying where, you know, I mean, obviously we don't, a good word. You know, I wasn't there, but, but, you know, what seemed to happen in this case was that this woman felt that, um, that her experience was, was nowhere to be seen. Like her, she couldn't convey her desires or her lack of desire and anything she said seemed to not be heard. And, that's bad sex and bad sex is really bad. It can leave you feeling humiliated, hurt, traumatized, and all those feelings have to be taken with the utmost seriousness. You know, to say something is bad sex and not assault is not to dismiss it. I think it's to say, you know, that's really fucking bad. And that's bad. where we should <laughs> that's be, bad. that's should where like we that. should be focusing. Yeah. Um, should we take some questions? Mm. I agree, Kristen. Um, Kristen Clifford 
Hey, Kristen, can you please speak more about the wounded weak woman versus confidence feminism? What about the spaces in between? Mm. I kind of want to hear what, what Kristen is saying. I kind of want her to, to join us. And now I've got this chat window obscuring you. Oh no, there you go, I've moved it. Okay. Um, so the spaces in between the wounded weak women. Well, yeah, exactly. Like neither, none of us are weak or confident, right? So, you know, the, the epigraph, is that the right word? The epigraph to the book is this quote from Jacqueline Rose from her essay on Marilyn Monroe, where she says, I do not find it helpful to present her or indeed any woman as either on top of or succumbing to her demons as though her only options were triumph or defeat a military vocabulary which could not be further from her own. And I, I love that quote because I think that so much kind of public discourse asks us to like separate women out into these categories of, you know, are you wounded and weak and a victim or are you a strong, confident woman? You know, when people talk about strong female characters in fiction and it, I find it, I find it sickening. I don't, I don't want to think of the world is divided between people who are somehow have somehow failed to reach this ideal or people who have succeeded, partly because that ideal I think is a vehicle for an incredibly individualistic way of looking at the social world that we're in and that praises women if they, if they individually manage to shake off the injustices and you know become CEOs or never experience sexual assault or whatever it is. And then we're all supposed to look down on the women who, you know, have the misfortune of experiencing sexual violence or just like not being able to deal with their circumstances, their difficult circumstances in such a way as to triumph over all these other women and become There's these kind of subjects of like feminist idealization. That That is not the feminism I want to espouse because all of us are vulnerable. Vulnerability is part of human life. It's perhaps especially part of the experience of being a woman in a world where sexual violence surrounds us at every turn. And I'm not interested in the idea of strong women. I think anybody who survives in the world is doing a good job. And I, I hate this vocabulary of like weakness versus strength. I think it's a way, it's a way for us to rank people rather than focusing on what we should really be focusing on, which is the conditions of life that make it difficult for us to just navigate the world without experiencing violence and humiliation. So, you know, just that whole vocabulary makes me kind of feel sick. And that space in between that Kristen mentions is, is exactly what I want us all to acknowledge. You know, we're, we're all vulnerable and men are vulnerable too. You know, vulnerability is a, is a, is a state that we all experience. And some of us deny it more insistently than others. <laughs> and, you know, I guess the question too is, you know, I, I don't think there's an answer, but how can one even think of good sex under patriarchy if patriarchy encompasses, you know, white supremacy, transphobia, homophobia, precarity, misogyny, you know, like the, like how, you know, someone asks the question, what do you think sex and desire will look like for women tomorrow as we emerge from quarantine? You know, one of the things you and I spoke about over email that I was really gratified reading your book. I was really, I really was kind of dreading reading it. Not because, I mean, I <laughs> always love being in your mindscape. I think you're, you know, such a forceful lyric thinker I love reading you but I'm like I couldn't possibly feel less sexy or less interested in sex I mean <laughs> I couldn't mm -hmm. possibly you know it's like I'm six months postpartum we're in a quarantine you know mm -hmm. we're in a time of extreme precarity and depression you know and it's just you know there's such this narrative um that, you know, sex positivity for all of its very good things in terms of like the sex positive conversation, you know, frames this concept that you should be up for it. That that's mm -hmm. like, that you're supposed to always be up for it. You know, you get this a lot when you have a baby, there's so mm -hmm. much, like the first thing they're like, you know, when, cause you're supposed to always make your partner happy and you couldn't possibly not be like into sex for mm -hmm. like a long time. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and it think- reminded me of the pressures you wrote about in the book. Like you even take on this concept, this like sex positive concept that one should always be up for sex, that that's something that one is supposed to mm. do for like relationship health. Yeah. And I think, I mean, it, it's exactly as you say, you know, the, the reality is for a lot of people and perhaps especially in the last year is that, you know, sex is not a simple matter for anyone. And this, you know, this narrative of like, um, you know, that, so- that somehow sexual fulfillment and it, it's, it's not just like a, a, a pleasurable thing that we might want in our lives, but it's a kind of, it's also like our duty as, as individuals who want to be healthy, you know, there's a lot of healthiest kind of discourse. A lot about, of fitness, you know, a lot of fitness. Yeah, sex exercise and like, you know, <laughs> orgasm is, is really good for your health. And, oh yeah, it's good for um, your skin, it's good for your relationship. Yeah, and it's like, yeah, sex is great and orgasms are really great. But, you know, I mean, Kristen said in one of her comments there, I saw about the, the kind of, um, I can't remember the, the phrase, like a sort of do me feminism sort of thing. And, and I think that, you know, one of the threads in the book is about um, the fact that, you know, if women's sexuality has been suppressed as it has, if women's sexuality is constantly shamed and policed and disciplined, um, it makes a kind of intuitive sense that, that the solution to that is uh, to, to advocate for, for the opposite of those things, right? So to, to, for us to come out of our of our sort of repressed shells, um, and and you know be desirous and, and active and be kind of gung ho and and have a purely kind of affirmative um, relationship to sex, and that gets tangled up with ideas of gender, right? Because and, and I trace some of that historically in the book to do with Masters and Johnson and sex research and and the idea that um, that sexual equality for women is sometimes seen to lie in sameness. So if we're going to be sexually emancipated, we have to be like how we imagine men to be, which is, you know, just constantly up for sex and this kind of spontaneous biological drive for sex um, that, that has been crushed. But if we if we uncrush it, you know, out we will come. Um, and I understand that logic because female sexuality has been repressed and women have the right to experience their desire and explore it and voice it without policing and punishment. But the fact is that we live in a culture that also makes that incredibly, incredibly difficult, not just because of the risk of sexual violence, but because because of capitalism, because of precarious living conditions, because of domestic violence, um, you know, because of horrendous racial bias that is totally entangled with ideas of whether women are able to say no or yes to sex at all. So all these things um, create a situation in which, in fact, it's not surprising to me that many women's sexual desire needs eliciting and more coaxing out, you know, the cliche that men are just like ready to go and that for women, you know, you have to kind of talk them into it. Um, And that, that idea gets picked up by by pickup artists who use it obviously to bully women and to say, oh, you know, it's just the slut shaming and the double standard that means that you that you think you don't want to have sex with me, but I know you do. And obviously that's horrendous. But the problem is, is that it is empirically true that sometimes sexual desire is not there for us and perhaps not for all men either, you know, isn't isn't necessarily there as this kind of endogenous force that kind of takes us over. Sometimes the context, well, the context is always operational in sex, you know, and the context for men and for women is very different. Men, straight men, live in a culture where their sexual desire is invited, is elicited, and is reaffirmed at every turn in such a way that there's a kind of positive reward cycle for their experience of sexual desire that is not the case for women (laughs) it's really not the case so is it any wonder that that men and women can manifest different sort of sexualities not as kind of essential biological differences between some very you know binarized conception of gender no but because we live in a culture and our sexualities only ever emerge in a culture and that culture does not serve us well (laughs) 
And so much of it is tied to, to age, I feel as well. And I think you address this in your chapter on arousal when you're dealing with Masters and Johnson. I loved reading this book too, is your um, treatise and meditation on sexology and on the field of sexology on Kinsey on Masters and Johnson. This idea of um, uh, that, you know, that one would like lose arousal or not have arousal or that one is going to lose that at some point. It's like such a fear in the culture, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, I really like how you disentangle just physical arousal from actual mm -hmm. intellectual, emotional, I don't know, what is desire? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's important to do, not least because, um, you know, women experience phys physiological arousal and orgasm. They're, they're capable of experiencing that physiological response during sexual assault. Um, so self-evidently, physiological arousal is not the same as pleasure or desire or consent or any of these things. And, you know, a lot of the, the sex researchers I discuss in the book, like the contemporary sex researchers are, you know, very clear about that in their research. But it's a very powerful idea in the culture that we can read women's bodies. You know, she was so wet that that means she wanted me. Um, and we don't read men's bodies in that way because when men have erection problems, we don't infer the same thing about them. We don't think we're seeing something about some fundamental aspect of their personhood. We tend to think of that as a kind of mechanical problem um, that doesn't interfere with their essential masculinity, which is about you know, sex drive. So, you know, how we think about arousal is so entangled with gender in really problematic ways. Here's um, Lauren Pierce's question. Um, can you speak to how to do this work in a way that is less emotionally exhausting? I'm an anthropologist who studies sexual harassment and assault and has personal experience with it. But while the work feels deeply important, both personally and culturally, mm. it also feels constantly racking. Is there a way you approach your work to protect yourself? And also, of course, talking about mm. the work now in this yeah. phase of publicity, as well as writing the work, publishing yeah. the, the publicness. That's such a great question, Lauren. Thank you. Um, yeah, I feel very moved by hearing your experience in that in that realm. I think it is it is really taxing, and I, you know, I. I don't, I don't really know how to protect oneself, except that I think, I think some of what I do is um, sometimes I just refuse to engage. <laughs> you know, there's, I feel like in me, there's a constant um, dynamic between like trying to confront these things and then just having to not engage, not read things, not watch whatever latest documentary about some horrible sexual predator or you know I have to I, I just have to manage that stuff um carefully I think because it it does get really wearing um and I think you know in a sense part of why this book took me a long time to write was partly that it was I didn't I didn't want to write about this stuff I was a bit sick of writing about complicated thorny questions about sex and desire and power you know especially I mean when me too you know, the kind of whole Weinstein aspect of me too kind of erupted. I remember for a few months, I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to write about this. I'm, I, I don't want to write about this. Like I, I was hearing myself not wanting to write about it, which may have been a clue that actually I did want to write about it because I was very insistent that I didn't. Um, and, and, and I did, but, but I felt this sense of dread because I thought, oh Christ, you know, this is going to be fun. And, and I suppose, you know, there's a pleasure, there is a real pleasure that I take in trying to understand something difficult and trying to clarify my own feelings and thoughts and um, trying to really hone a piece of writing. But um, I don't know, I just really hear you. It is quite exhausting. <laughs> and you have to do whatever you have to do to keep, you know, to preserve yourself. Because also none of us, I think, individually obliged to do anything to, to help this problem, you know, you you also have a, a responsibility to take care of yourself in a very hostile world. So protect yourself at all costs, I think.
Yeah, I, yeah, I, you know, and I think that something that I became pretty uncomfortable about teaching creative writing for now a while was there's this concept that one is supposed to dig deeper and write about mm -hmm. one's personal life. And I think you are under no obligation to re-traumatize yourself in writing. Absolutely. And I think there's so much of this idea that, you know, one has some sort of obligation or some sort of public obligation to, but I think, mm -hmm. I think if it's this idea of taking care, we, we live in a culture that does not take care. Yeah. Take yeah care. And, and we have the right to, to refuse or, or, but also we have the right to, to silence, I think, you know, and to privacy. I, you know, increasingly feel that, that especially with social media, it's very, um, it, it's sometimes even difficult to see how incentivized we are to, to make statements all the time about things and to engage with things. And sometimes I just feel like I'm not going to read that story. I'm not, I'm not going to listen to that podcast, even if it's something that I'm interested in. And, and sometimes that might be a kind of phobic avoidance, but sometimes it's like, I don't, I don't want to think about this. And, and it's not, it's not my, it's not on my shoulders, you know, it's not, it's not on any of our shoulders. Like it's not, it's not for us to figure out how to live in such a way as to, as to cope with these risks and to try and address them. It's, that's a collective endeavor and people can withdraw from, from the conversation as much as they want to. I mean, I get, I get really upset and pissed off with, you know, sometimes on Twitter, you see people saying, why aren't people saying things about X, Y, Z? Why aren't people declaring things? And I, I, no one has the right to another person's speech or their internal mind, their, their inner life. We have inner lives and we have to really protect them. I'm very impassioned for, for <laughs> middle of the night. Maybe it's yeah. when I get more impassioned, but you know, everyone has the right to like, just cope the way they, the way they need to cope and you, nobody is obliged nobody owes anything to anyone in terms of their speech right so that's beautifully put um stephanie do we have time for one more question or should we wrap it up i think one more question is fine if Catherine's up for it yep totally fine um, i'm gonna ask I, I really like um leanne's question Something I think about a lot is how sex workers understand consent better than anyone and how they've made significant contributions to our broader cultural understanding of sex. Do you think sex work can lead us to more equitable sex tomorrow? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think so, you know some of the most interesting things I've read in recent years around, um, around sex, around power, around consent, around abuse, around race, around... All these things have been um, have been by sex worker activists. Um, there's that really great book called Revolting Revolting Prostitutes. I think that's the right title by Juno Mack and Molly Smith. That is just so good on um, you know on how like bizarre and contorted the the whole debate around sex work is and um, how kind of counterproductive it is. Um, and I think that, I mean, I'm, I'm, I tend to be wary of, um, you know, sometimes there's a kind of narrative of like, uh, yeah, and you see this in relation to like kink and BDSM where people sometimes say like, you know, everyone in the BDSM community understands consent better than anyone else. I mean, I think to some extent that's true because consent is a much more um, explicitly articulated part of sexual interactions in BDSM communities. And there's there's a lot more kind of coherent and and externalized thought about that and that and that's to the good, but you know abuse happens everywhere. Abuse happens within kink communities, and I'm I'm skeptical of you know idealizing any particular kind of um, community because I think you know my one of my kind of deep hunches is that like abuse can always happen because because power relations are always there between individuals so so nothing actually is is foolproof um but anyway sorry that's a slight tangent but on on the sex work question i think that um it's it's so it's so important that um that we take 
contractual sex very, very seriously. You know, one of the critiques of aspects of consent is sometimes like, oh, consent, it's very, it's very transactional, you know, all these, all these people writing out these little contracts and asking one another, can, you know, can I touch you here? Um, and that kind of rhetoric is very dismissive of contracts, but um, contracts are really, really important. Agreements are really important. Asking someone if uh, you have permission to do something or if, or if they have desire to do something is hugely important. And I think sex work activists have been so good at articulating the need for that. While at the same time, you know, showing us how, um, how a lot of the, kind of disdain or like discomfort around sex work while a lot of it is very well-meaning some of it is totally imbued with a kind of misunderstanding about the distinction between contractual sex and kind of romantic sex you know the problem the problem with consensual and contractual approaches to sex isn't isn't that they're unromantic or they're unsexy it's that they don't think through power relations and I think sex workers know better than anyone about power relations because they're having to negotiate them in situations often of very great risk minute by minute um so i've certainly i've learned a huge amount from um reading um writings by sex workers and i and i i think it's really painful that um that there is still so much kind of phobia and horror around you know, including sex workers in the conversation about something that they're very, very knowledgeable about. And just how horrifying legislation is like SESTRA, which is, you know, seeking to take away rights to protect against yeah. abuses and to take away this, you know, this sense of like of agency. Um, yeah, exactly. So yeah, I think some of the most um, urgent feminist thinkers now have are have been sex workers are sex workers or... yeah and it's so interesting isn't it because I think back to um you remember Marie Calloway's book the uh what purpose did I serve in your life that was such a controversial book I mean coming back to what we were talking about about sort of first person writing or sort of auto fiction and um I remember that book being I mean that was 2013 I think as well that was really interesting in terms of sex work because she talked about experiences of sex work and that book was such an interesting, strange, compelling kind of exploration of power dynamics in both um, you know, non-contractual sex and in contractual sex. And I think she was really onto something and I don't think people were quite ready for that book. Yeah. <laughs> it elicited a lot of uh, weird responses. People were freaked out, yeah, for sure. Mm. Well, it's so nice to. This is what it's like. Two a.m. Your time. What is it? Two. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. It's, been it's so been... nice. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, and we hope next time it can be back at the store. Oh yeah, yeah. that would be great. It will happen. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Care. Good Thanks, night. Stephanie. Thanks, Catherine. Bye. Bye. Bye.